everybody and welcome back to the first fossil friday chats of 2021 so if you find a fossil how do you make sure that everybody knows about it well we're going to learn more about that today with science writer riley black i'm your host Brittany stoneberg from the western science center and i'm your co-host gabriel santos from the alf museum <laughs> And uh, today, like I said, we are going to learn a lot from science writer Riley Black. She is the author of Skeleton Keys, My Beloved Brontosaurus, and more, with bylines and publications from Nature to Slate. She also volunteers with field crews from multiple institutions each summer to carry out fossil field work throughout the West. Riley, it's so good to see you. We've been friends for a while, and it's so good to have you on the show. Oh, I'm so honored excited. to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. This is going to be fun. <laughs> so Alrighty, every, alrighty, everybody. And just as a reminder, uh, we are now on Twitch and YouTube. If you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat, and we will do our best to answer as many as we can in the Q&A section uh, after Riley's done with her presentation. So, Riley, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. And stories. So I do lots of different storytelling. Story I've worked, worked on, on books. I've worked with Universal on some of their Jurassic World marketing stuff. I've written scripts for uh, the Eon show that you might have seen on PBS or YouTube. Um, but I wanted to pick three types of science journalism, or at least three stories that reflect the different pathways that stories go from like a really neat fossil to something that shows up in Scientific American or National Geographic. So the first one that I want to tell you about, it's just something that's so cool to start with. Like, even if you don't get anything about the science journalism aspect of this, I think it's just a really neat finding. And it has to do with uh, our Ice Age friends, the dire wolves. So, if you aren't already aware, dire wolves were real. They're not just a Game of Thrones thing. George R. R. Martin took them from the fossil record and modified them a bit. But these are real critters that were running around during the Pleistocene. And you, know, you find a ton of them at La Brea, but they've also been found like throughout much of the Western US, like parts of Mexico as well. I think they're found all the way down into the northern parts of South America. And these really famous wolves, I mean, they're not all that bigger than the biggest gray wolves of today, but just that name like dire wolf and the idea that these things were taking down ice age megafauna, it's really just fascinated people for about 200 years. So naturally, when I heard that there was a big story coming up about dire wolves, I had to jump on it. So that started with something else. So years ago, I had seen a presentation by um, paleontologist Julie Meachin about a mummified wolf puppy that was found in the Yukon, and it was the best uh, mummified Ice Age wolf or wolf pup that had ever been found, you know, anywhere, really. You know, even though we get some great stuff out of Siberia, this is the best example. And to find it in a place where we normally don't get this kind of preservation, it was really remarkable. So I kept an ear open for that story at the time. So this was a presentation that was at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology annual meeting. It's held every year. This is where a lot of researchers either bring studies that have just been published or more often stuff that they're working on, they kind of want comment on or some collaboration with. So it can sometimes take years from the time that you see something at an SVP talk to the time it shows up as a paper to when I can write about it. Sometimes I get the chance to write about stuff before it comes out. And that's really neat. But most of the time, I just kind of take a note and I try and keep it in the back of my mind, like keep an eye out for this paper or this kind of research from this person or this research group so I can really pounce on it when the time is right. So in this case, um, Julie and I, we, we chat, you know, I've done field work with her as well. So she's really wonderful. And she let me know that this fossil was finally making its way to publication. And I thought, you know, mummy wolf pup like from the ice age has all this other information about like what this animal ate how it was preserved what the environment was like at the time like i i need to write about this so i pitched it around to a few places so that's a large part of my job is identifying story ideas identifying when the story is going to be out who it's by you know are there good images all that sort of stuff and i packed it all together and I take it to an editor, I said, would you like the story? And I hope that they say yes, and that they give me lots of money for it, which sometimes happens, not as often as would be helpful. But in this case, I kind of went back and forth with my editor at National Geographic for a while. 
And eventually they said, yes, we'd like to have this story. So in interviewing um, Dr. Meejan about this, we got towards the end of our conversation. I learned as much as I could about Zhur. That's the name of the Ice Age wolf pup. And Julie said, have you heard about the dire wolves? And I said, no, I haven't heard about the dire wolves. What's going on with the dire wolves? And she let me know that there's this huge study of which she was a part that fundamentally changes what we know about dire wolves, like what they are. You know, this animal that we thought was so familiar, basically a close relative of gray wolves that you know, lived in North America during the Pleistocene. Gray wolves came over from Eurasia. Eventually, we lost the dire wolves. We had gray wolves. It seemed like a relatively simple story. Well, it turns out that dire wolves are not really wolves. The conclusion in this paper, this really huge genetic study that involved all these different labs independently trying to look at dire wolf DNA, when they saw where these wolves fit on the evolutionary tree of dogs, it wasn't near gray wolves at all. It wasn't even near coyotes or something wolf-like. It was more towards where, like, where jackals are. We don't know exactly what like, the ancestor of the dire wolf looks like, but they seem to be part of this North American dog lineage that had been evolving on their own for about five and a half million years. That was the last time they shared a common ancestor with gray wolves. So this is really kind of neat because dire wolves, when you look at their skeletons, it's often hard to tell whether... You know, it's a gray wolf, a dire wolf, this other form called a Beringian wolf that's like, like a hypercarnivorous gray wolf. So we have all these wolf-type things roaming around North America in the Ice Age, and it turns out at least one of them is not a wolf at all. So once I found out about that, I pitched it around. It turned out that National Geographic already had somebody on it, and that often happens. Sometimes you pitch stuff, and somebody already has an in or got to it before you, and you just go nuts and you take it to the next place. So I contacted my editor at Scientific American and I said, there's this really important like game changer study. And I don't say that a lot. Like it's pretty rare to get these things. We always want to have the big story, the big scoop. But in this case, like this was for real. This is something that I was really excited about. I was telling friends of mine just saying like, Shh, like dire wolves aren't wolves. Don't tell anybody else. I can tell you and it'll be explained in about a week. But I was just so excited about this conclusion. So initially, my editor at Scientific American said, OK, it seems interesting. Is it really that important? And I was like, yes, it really, really is. And I really want to write this story. And I'd worked with this editor enough that we had like that level of trust. That I wasn't kind of just cold calling as someone off the street. So he said, OK, give me like 600 words on dire wolves. I went about talking to the researchers behind the study itself. For these stories, you always want to get an outside comment to just say, OK, this paper came out with these results. Is this on the mark or not? Is there anything that surprises you about this aside from like the big picture content? Really just give me a read on like, is this science solid? And everybody was coming back saying like, this is amazing. So we ran with the story. This is what the final product looked like uh, for Scientific American. Turns out that uh, dire wolves should probably be called tech in technical terms, uh, anocyan diarus, which basically means terrible wolf. And I asked the authors of the paper, like, should we be calling them something else? Like maybe like a terrible jackal or something. Is it, you know, dire wolf is fine. We have main wolves that are not really wolves at all. So it kind of works. But that was just a really neat example, just like even to myself of how researching one story and digging into it leads to a tip that becomes something else that really takes off on its own, that these bits of research and who's studying what, they're really kind of linked together. And you might not get that idea from just seeing the scattershot nature of science media, that stuff kind of pops up all over the place. But this is one way in which stories sometimes happen where you're just talking to somebody, they sit, make an offhand comment, you know, like, wait, what, say that again. And it leads to another great story. Another type of story that I sometimes do is when an editor approaches me with something. And this is something that I've cultivated over time, and that's my expertise is in paleontology and writing about fossils. I read about other things. One of my favorite stories, I think, from last year was about why many leopards are um, black or melanistic. Um, and that was something I just like, I love cats. I love wild cats. This is a really cool bit of research. But that's relatively rare. That's not where my name is. People know me for the writing I do about fossils and because I wrote about it quite a bit for Smithsonian and other outlets when I was writing my beloved Brontosaurus and um, that book was basically prehistoric sex stuff. Like basically if a fossil animal shows up 
in you know sort of a courtship mode with another individual or they're you know fossilized mating or there's fossil genitals i get calls from editors saying riley can you write this story which is not a bad rep to have i guess so in this case my editor at smithsonian who i've been working with um for a while and i'm happy to say that smithsonian's been a great supporter of my work i've been working with them for more than a decade now i think basically saw the press release for this particular paper coming up about a fossil assassin bug, a 50 million year old assassin bug found in Colorado that had um, the fossil genitals of this individual like perfectly preserved. And this is really rare to find, like there are thousands of assassin bug species today. You might have one in, even in your house, like they're, they're kind of everywhere, but we only have 50 in the fossil record. And this particular example has those anatomical parts preserved. And that's important, not just from kind of like, a, you know, silly kind of paleo angle perspective, but because insect genitals are often used to identify which species is which and to tell the difference between them. So this is actually really important that narrows down, not just that this is an assassin bug, but specifically like what group it belongs to, how it relates to other ones. Uh, so that was really kind of neat. And it was neat that in this particular story, somebody found the initial fossil or um, yeah somebody found the initial fossil someone then purchased it and the person who purchased it knew that there was a counterpart to it that the other half had been sold to somebody else so the researchers who were the lead authors on the study they got in touch with the person with the initial piece they got the person with the other one to uh, sell it to them so it's a kind of like fossil detective work story as well as just the scientific Part of it and that's part of a journalist's work as well is that you don't want to just be a science cheerleader when somebody gives you a paper or something to write about you want to say okay like is this on the mark i want to check this with other researchers is there another angle on the story or is there something else that's going on here um sometimes you know the way that we get fed science news it's difficult to um tell what the real story is sometimes so it would the easy way to do my job would be just to look for press releases, just to look for what press information officers at journals and universities, like basically send me every day. And that usually has an image and it already has some poll quotes in it and it kind of tells you what the main conclusions are. But sometimes you read the paper and the most exciting thing about it or the most controversial thing about it is not actually in that press release at all. So the easy thing to do would be to just basically parrot what's in the press release and you're, then you're really just putting forward with the scientist is telling you you're not really doing your job as a journalist. Uh, so even if you check things and things are okay, at least like you're like, okay, I've taken this in, I've processed this, I've compared it. This is what the story really is. So this was a case where there were some other dimensions to it that I thought were kind of neat. And yeah, I was just really happy that my editor pinged me with that one. And the story that I'm going to end with today is something of a little bit more of an off-speed pitch. It's connected to the other, because obviously this is about fossil genitals as well. But um, sometimes stories just pop up in a way that you don't expect, or you get to write something in a way that you don't expect. As a freelance journalist, sometimes I have editors approaching me. More often, I need to pitch them. And I'd say half the time, maybe a little bit more, pitches don't get accepted. Either somebody else is writing it, or there's not enough time to write about it, or they don't think it's important. Those are the really frustrating ones. It's always frustrating when you have someone's like, this is so cool. I want to tell everybody, and your editor is kind of like, and I just, I don't really like it. And that, that's, those are the heartbreakers. And I usually try and find some other way to wrap those together. So in this case, I'd written a piece for Slate earlier in the year uh, in 2020 about pandemic puppies and just how everybody's adopting dogs and dogs growing up in isolation and really just getting used to, you know, one person or one family can have socialization problems. It's going to be difficult when people start going back to school or to work. So kind of like this great thing, but that you know, requires a bit more care. And Slate has a different kind of tonality to it than the other publications I've mentioned. Like the way that I would write a National Geographic article or a Scientific American article is not the way that I'd write for Slate. You kind of need a little bit of an opinion. You kind of need like an angle, something that you want to argue or present to go in some of the Slate. It's kind of like I'm doing journalism, but it's almost like an op-ed-ish kind of style, like basically like an informed op-ed in a way. So I had pitched my editor at Slate something that I think was about uh, the psychological effects of the COVID-19 uh, isolation uh, during the pandemic. And 
just how we have a lot more sort of public policing of what our friends and relatives and stuff are, are doing and why why are we doing this basically and some other people have um, written about this as well and sort of like what sociology of science and psychologists have to say versus what we're actually doing so it wasn't new enough there was you know there was an argument there but basically been made by by other writers and i said okay we totally understand um you know there is some neat stuff coming out like this dinosaur butthole paper <laughs> and because it, at the time it was a, a, a preprint so it wasn't technically published but it was out on the internet you could read the paper you could see the figures it seemed to be really interesting i'd written about dinosaur reproduction i think for slate and other places before so this is a way to kind of pick up that whole thread and my editor immediately said like yeah write that story like we, we want that story it's like okay so in this case, I didn't really do as much reporting on it. I didn't speak to the researchers because the paper wasn't out yet. And it turns out there's a more complicated story about like two different research teams who are writing about the same thing. The, a study on the same specimen actually just came out in this past week and had a lot of news coverage that's different from the preprint that I was looking at. But that's a whole other story that I didn't know about at the time. Basically, I just read this preprint and I used that as a jumping off point to say, okay, well, what do we know about dinosaur anatomy and what's missing and why are these things important? It wasn't just kind of like a teehee, we found dinosaur genitals. It was more of a matter of like, okay, we have this anatomical thing that you think would be relatively simple. Why is it so rare and why is it important to know? So really taking it from that standpoint and expanding from there was something that was, it was just really fun to do in a kind of different mode. So there are other forms of writing and other forms of journalism that I do and that I've done. But I like to think that these three main examples kind of show the different routes by which stories come to you that, you know, we often don't look at bylines um, in science, science news. Like sometimes I even forget to look. We often, we're kind of basing things on the Im imprimatur of where it's being published, the publication. So like when you go to National Geographic, you're expecting a certain kind of presentation. When you go to Slate, you're expecting a very different kind of presentation. And it's kind of the the brand of that magazine or the publication is what my work kind of gets presented through and what sometimes I need to modify the work to fit in order to have a successful pitch. But behind the scenes of all that, this is what's often going on. And before I wind up my time, I just want to give you a, a little sort of a framework to understand when you read science news, why it looks the way that it does. So in a way, it's not very difficult to be a science journalist in terms of like we're constantly getting ideas from stories, journals about a week before a paper comes out, they'll put out uh, an embargoed paper list. So they'll tell you what's going to be in the next issue. And then from there, um, you can sift through pitch that to your editor if they say yes you have a couple of days to gather the quotes you need so that when that embargo lifts and the paper is officially out your story can be right there at the same time and that's a lot of science news that's the bread and butter of science news and most of the time when you see those pieces they're in what's called an inverted pyramid shape so that means at the very very top you're going to get in the headline it was called the subhead so that's like the subtitle beneath that that you usually see and then that first line to that first paragraph it's telling you like the most important thing about this study or this finding or whatever it is that that way if you stop reading or you glance over to something else at least you've gotten that piece of information then usually in the next paragraph you have a little bit of background you know where the study appeared why it's important is it building off anything else it's a little bit of background and then you usually have comments from researcher a so somebody who is involved in the actual study they usually get the first quotation and then you usually have comments from researcher B who's saying like, yes, this is great or no, this is not so great. And then you kind of wind it up at the very end with the kicker or sort of conclusion. Now, these things don't always follow in exactly that order, but that's the general idea that as you read down the piece, you're getting more depth. And it's usually important because sometimes there's a contradiction or sometimes somebody say, like, well, this is really great, but we still don't know about this other aspect. So if you only read the headline, you only read that first paragraph, you're only really getting a piece of the story. But that's how these things are usually done. If you look at this sort of conveyor belt line of a lot of science news, it goes from, you know, let's say journal sends press release science journalist says this is cool takes it to an editor an editor says okay write the story you know comments from run 
a researcher in the study are collected, comments from somebody outside the study are collected. It's filtered through this format, usually within about 500 to 800 words or so. And then it's produced in that fashion. There are other modes of storytelling. There are other ways of talking about these things. Like the uh, piece that I did for Slate is a little bit different. But a lot of the stuff you see will fall into that format. And that's I feel like that's important to know that, you know, we're I don't want journalism to be like an argument from authority. Like, well, you know, I researched the story, so you should trust everything I say. Like read pieces critically, know how they're put together and how they're produced. Because oftentimes there's a sort of feedback loop that happens where there are what might be considered top tier journals. So places like Nature or Science or PNAS, where people like Lots of folks are reading that every week. There's a sort of self-assumed importance about those. And because those journals are thought to be important, if a study appears there, it's thought to be important. And therefore, it's more likely that journalists are going to write about it where there might be something equally or even more amazing in a more specific research journal that just doesn't get the same attention. So these are all the things that are going on behind the scenes that inform what goes out to the public and these stories can come together through a lot of different routes. So I didn't really talk about book writing at all. If you're interested in my writing and fossil stuff, these are the various books that I've written. Uh, the latest one, did you see that dinosaur is a search and find children's book? That's the first one under my actual name. The rest, unfortunately, are still under my dead name. Hopefully that we'll be able to fix that at some point. But during the q and I'm more than happy to answer questions about science book writing or really anything else involved in the various kinds of writing that I do and not just the journalism stuff. I just wanted to focus on that for today, but there's so many other forms of SciComm out there. And yeah, and that's, yeah that's, 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 what that's what I've got, got for, now. for now. So I'm, so I'm happy, happy to jump, jump on, on over the Q&A part. part. Awesome, well, thanks, Riley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you, Riley. That was great. I think that was like a perfect Look, look behind, behind the curtain. The curtain. Um, um, I don't, I don't think, think a lot of people understand, understand like how does science, science that is done by, by a few researchers, researchers by an institution get to, get to the public. public. Yeah, yeah, and I think, I think it's public and what doesn't, and it's not necessarily the best thing or the most exciting thing at the time. Like something entirely amazing can come out and the people who want to write about it or the publications might say like, well, it's coming out over Christmas or something, so nobody's going to be in the office, so we can't talk about it. And that study might be entirely missed or might have to get folded into something later. So there are all these different considerations that go into it. There's a story that I did for um, New Scientist about a fossil bird with a toucan-like skull found the Cretaceous rocks of Ooh. Madagascar. It was really neat, yeah. As soon as I saw the image and I saw the art, like, this is really cool. I want to write about it. And this is like the day before Thanksgiving. So oh. I knew that any uh, American-based publication that I pitched wouldn't be able to take it. Like nobody would be in the office, no one would be able to edit it. The tur turnaround was too tight. But I do some freelancing for New Scientist, which is based out of England. And since they don't share that same day off, I. I just took a chance and said like, hey, this is coming out super fast. I understand that there's not time, but I'd really love to write about it. And they've said yes, and I ended up writing the story. So sometimes there's a certain amount of like strategy when you get to know publications and editors, like not only in their tonality, but what the work schedules and stuff look like. Some places are able to say like, yep, as long as you have that for me tomorrow, I'm totally good. And others might say like, we need a week lead time to do this. So that's all the little sort of like stuff that you kind of keep in the back of your mind as you're gathering and pitching these stories. When you're going into science writing specifically, what kind of training do you need? Or can it, is it something that you can just kind of like jump into sometimes? So for my part, I jumped into it. And this in some ways has to do with like what science communication looked like about 10 years ago. 15 years ago, where even though blogs were not a new thing in terms of, you know, stuff like Live Journal and Blogger and um, Zanga and all that sort of stuff, uh, science writers and scientists were really just starting to get into blogs as a way to just go direct to the public with stuff. And that's where I got my start. It's like, okay, I can just like set up my own little spot on the web and I can talk about the stuff that I think is cool. And gradually that led to a career in science writing. Basically, I learned by doing it that I read a whole bunch of books and papers. I would talk about what I was learning and what I thought. I'd react to other people. Like at the time, Twitter and 
Facebook that they existed, but a lot of the conversation was happening like on blogs themselves. So you'd add people to your blog role and they could see that. And you you'd check like where your traffic was coming from. They're like, oh, like Ferengula linked to me. That's kind of cool. I'll go over there and leave a, leave a comment and that would feed back. And stuff. so it's like this ecosystem of a lot of science writers and journalists and scientists and stuff like talking to each other. And that's where I started. Now it's much more professionalized. Like if you want to start a blog, certainly go for it. It's great writing practice. It really, really is. But in a way, things have shifted back almost to what they were like pre-blog, where if you want to get involved in science writing, you either need to find a way to do that through an institution like a museum or a university, or you need to go to journalism school, or you kind of just take your chances out on the web. But there's not that same kind of densely entangled um, relationship between like writers and editors where we all kind of know each other and we go to the same meetings and everything else. It's much harder to sort of like be discovered in a way. So you need some way to kind of get in the door, whether that's through, yeah, basically becoming trained as a journalist or working through an institu institution that does science communication of some form. And science writing isn't the only form of psychom. I want to be really clear about that as well, that like I'm writing, but we're in an age where a lot of people don't read or they read very, very, very little. And maybe the most effective way to reach people or to do a form of writing that translates into something else is you start a science TikTok and you get shares that way, or you focus on coming up with posts that work well for Facebook or, you know, make YouTube videos because a lot of people watch YouTube rather than what's actually on television now. So like my advice for any kind of like science communication, even if you want to do forms of writing is you kind of pick you kind of pick your spot, like one or two things, one or two apps or areas that you really like that fit, that really fits your style. And then focus on just like cultivating your voice and your following and stuff there. Because if you try and do everything at once, it's like, okay, I've got my blog and I promote it through my Twitter, which also goes to my Facebook and I do a TikTok about behind the scenes things. It's like, it's too much and it'll drive you off the wall. <laughs> so it's kind <laughs> of like picking like, what is your strength? Is it, you know, audio? Is it video? Is it writing? And, you know, teaming up with folks if, you know, you have like matching skills and you want to do something together. I think that's more where we are now. This, where I came up through, anybody can get out there and start writing and kind of be found through their skill or expertise. That doesn't exist as much anymore. I'm sad to see that go, but I think there are still alternate routes outside of official like J, J school stuff. Um, it's just through apps and stuff that already exists where you can kind of plug into an audience who's hungry for that that storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. Right, I have a question. So yeah. um, you're you're prolific both in, you know, science writing in, in regards to journalism, but as you uh, noted at the end of the talk, you have a lot of books. Do you what's the difference between writing for an article or for a book? And do you do you have a preference? Like do you prefer like you're like, oh man, just just give me a book or yeah. you know, <laughs> like what like in terms of writing, like what uh, what do you like doing? So it's different flavors, right? The way that I like to think about it is like cooking in a way. It's like writing an article is kind of like making a snack or making something quick. That's like my 45 minute like pizza dough recipe where it's just like I'm hungry and I got to eat in an hour. So it's like I know I can make it. It'll rise. It'll be like maybe not mind blowing, but it'll be like perfect, perfectly cromulent pizza that I can do relatively quickly. <laughs> Whereas like if I'm having people over or something, like hopefully well again someday, like everybody else, um, it's more like planning, okay, what do I want to do for the appetizer? What do I want to do for the, for the main? Are we doing dessert? Should I pair it with anything? Where you're kind of like orchestrating this thing that's bigger than the sum of its parts, where it's almost like an experience. And that's what books are like. And they have different flavors to them that when I'm sort of in, in my article writing journalist mode, it's more like, am I in the tone of the magazine? Um, I know this editor likes when I'm really specific about places, so I got to make sure I put that in there. You're kind of, there's more of a direct collaboration between you and your editor. And it's in a much shorter format where like there's so many side things. Like I just did a, a tribute, um, hopefully it'll appear soon, to Mary Dawson, a, a pioneering Arctic paleontologist. She worked at the uh, Carnegie Museum of Natural History for decades, changed the field, like everybody should know her. And there was so much stuff that was great that I had to cut out because of the time constraints and stuff. In the book, you don't really have that as much. You can 
take those detours as long as they make some kind of sense. So I love the freedom of books where like this is your space, like to really lay out your argument and explore a little bit. And you have like freedom to roam because you're just creating this thing that's 70,000 words long that eventually sent your editor and you hope that they <laughs> like it. And it's a very different animal in terms of like the pacing the choreography it's almost like to pick another example if you don't like cooking it's like drawing where you start with an initial sketch and the gesture and then you start to build out okay where does the musculature go and then you start putting the skin the top layers on top of it so by time you get the finished thing you're seeing the outside but you know all those layers beneath and how they go together the way that they do so i love writing books it is kind of like pushing a boulder uphill sometimes <laughs> But <laughs> writing articles, I feel like I like this the immediacy the of it. And it forces me to write short in a way. So like, what is really important? What do I want the take home message to be about that? And they do feed into each other in terms of the research that like what I generally write articles about, it often has something to do with the books I'm writing. Cause that's where my attention is. That's what I'm researching and what more information about. So if you really were to like, look at my body of writing as a whole, you largely see like, oh, the, a lot of these things go together. Yeah, I could see how a book would be slightly Sisyphean um, <laughs> in the attempt to write it. It's scary. It's putting well, your brain on the page for not just something that someone can click on and be like, okay, that was near. Like, you are asking people to pay like 25 bucks, which, let's be honest, isn't all that much. It's like two tickets to a movie and a popcorn. But still, it feels like a big thing. You're asking people to like invest in something that basically you're saying, this is really cool. Please read my story. And you have no idea how it's going to be received or if people will like it um, until really it comes out and you start getting those reactions back. So it's a much slower burn and you're kind of like left with yourself in your own head for a little while. So it's like, that's why it's important to have beta readers and other people to comment and stuff on it. But it's a very, very different experience. Yeah, it's like in some ways, like even though I've written so many books already, Every time I do it, there's still that same kind of nervousness about it's like, oh, I hope I can actually do this. <laughs> but I, I think there's like that different power in books, you know, I mean, obviously, you're a fantastic storyteller. And both Brittany and I are very much using science storytelling and science narrative to like, share our passions with the world and stuff. But with a book, you have that ability to really create this powerful narrative that people can connect to, right? And it's like, I think there's a question I have for that. Like, how can you how how can you tell people that they need to utilize narrative more? And when we share our science, I mean, there's a lot of folks out there who do it effortlessly and kind of automatically. But I think there's a lot of folks out there who who haven't yet realized the power of utilizing narrative in sharing and connecting people. Absolutely, um, and. I think sometimes we call it, we try and label it and call it like an emotional appeal or, or something else. Cause that's the stuff like when we're preparing for college and stuff, right? It's like we go through our, like our standardized writing classes and how you're supposed to write. But then everybody that we like reading doesn't do those things. So where do those things like come together? And I think a lot like narrative exists in any kind of writing that that we do. I think that's step one. It's It's the same idea as when we talk about objectivity and science that like we're trying to say okay under these conditions under this observation at this time we got this result but that's not often translated it's often like we found this end of story and that science is an attempt at something that's objective but done by subjective people that who we are and what our perspective is and how we've been trained and what we want to say like this matters for the way that we carry out science, the kind of questions that we ask, um, the way it gets translated. You know, for example, like I wonder sometimes if paleontology and dinosaur paleontology in particular weren't as sort of male dominated as it historically has been. Thankfully, that's changing a bit. But like, would there be as much emphasis on this kind of like nature red and tooth and claw view that like dinosaurs are primarily like these scary, drooling, monstrous kind of things? Like, why is it so unusual to us? that, you know, there'd be a dinosaur like Myasaur that, you know, is showing parental care or, you know, even just pictures of dinosaurs sleeping or other things. Like, this is all stuff that, like, what gets presented to us matters. And I think narrative plays into that in that even when you write a scientific paper, there's a narrative to it. Like I talked about the inverted pyramid, right? Well, if you look at a scientific paper, it's very similar 
in a way, and that you have the abstract act up top. So you're basically saying like, this is the main takeaway. And then you have all that background, like this is what's done been done before, and this is why it's important. And then you get into the method section, and then you know, sort of the, um, you know, the data part, and then the conclusion that there is a flow that's expected. There's a kind of narrative saying like, here's what we found. This is why we're interested in it. Here's how we studied it. This is what we learned. That's a narrative. That's a story. And to say that science inherently doesn't have narrative and narrative is this kind of like special thing. I think some people look down on it. It goes into a long history. I think of scientists and people involved in science looking down on terms like narrative and storytelling is too squishy. Like you're almost like lying to the public or something like that, but we're always doing it all the time. And I think once we grasp that, then we can start to understand the responsibility that comes with it. It's like, okay, like I'm laying out a point that I want to make. How am I doing it? Why am I doing it this way? Is there another perspective that might help? So I think in basically any kind of storytelling or outreach that we do, there is narrative to it. Like basically, unless you just print out a whole bunch of data for somebody, it's like, this book is just, you know, like phylogenetic, like cladistic traits that I put into my diagram. And even then, it's like, well, why did you pick those things? Why are they in that order and stuff? And there's still stuff behind that, even if it's harder to parse. But I think that that's part of just being a scientist and being a communicator. It's like, whether we like it or not, we are constantly creating narratives. And I think once we own that, then we can more responsibly and more compellingly shape those narratives. Golf clap, because um, I don't want to yeah. change the levels on my mic. <laughs> <laughs> small golf class for riley um yeah okay so we have some great questions from our uh from our viewers so i'm gonna go ahead and get through as many of those as we can do um let's see this is from our uh friend and frequent viewer diana pomeroy who's asking what was one of your most favorite recent stories to tell in terms of paleo so on hi diana good to hear from you and i think some of the ones that i picked for this session were um, some of my favorite ones. Like I really enjoyed writing about the Ice Age wolves, both dire wolves and, and gray wolves and how those stories kind of complemented each other and fed into each other. Like sometimes I almost wish I can get like everything under one banner so everybody can see how these things kind of complement each other. Um, in terms of other recent work that I've done, this is in a way is a difficult question because I need to jog my own memory. I'm going to actually open my phone real quick and say like, what should I write? Because I've got a little like Telegram channel where I post everything. Well, let's say like I'm, I'm working on, you know, five or six things at any yeah. given time. Um, so I think one of the ones that I really enjoyed, yeah, it was just kind of a little one-off thing that I thought about. So I did a piece for Sierra about uh, bio crusts. So these organic communities that if you got into the desert if you go to a place like arches uh, national park or dinosaur national monument many places throughout the west particularly in arid environments you'll look down on the ground and you see like these little towers these little dark towers and they're made they're basically a community of many different organisms so there are lichens and mosses and cyanobacteria and uh, fungi and all this stuff that kind of lives together in this top little like rind of the soil but it helps keep the desert together it helps it from blowing away it creates temperature differences it can actually um, detoxify certain uh, pesticides or other compounds so basically clean parts of the desert just through its normal activities as a group of organisms and i just thought that was so neat because so often when you go on these trails you'll see a little sign that says like do not step on you know the living bio crust and, and the darker versions of this have like all these little like blobs going like no like oh, no. <laughs> with the boots on. it's like you know just really trying to get people not to do this and there are always boot prints around it anyway but just like this really amazing thing this this communal organism basically made up of all these different species all these different basically phyla like these things aren't even that closely related that are so critical to the health of the desert and it's so easy to overlook like i can look at a, a raven or a jackrabbit or a mule deer so i'm like oh like wildlife that's wonderful that's cool and meanwhile like for you know meters around there's this group of organisms that are so critical to the desert so that it just made me really happy to be able to talk to somebody about that and write that a little bit just kind of like muse over this thing that's been overlooked 
a little bit. And I really love opportunities like that. Like there's always going to be a new issue of nature or science or whatever next week. Science is always learning from what we previously knew and expanding from that. But to just like take something that's evergreen, take something that's a story that I really feel is my own that just kind of came out of my own passion for the subject. That's, it's really fun to write. What a cool story. Sorry. Every time Sorry, you're writing... I'm... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, every time you're writing... There's a, there's a comment on the YouTube that just said, it's from our friend Amy Atwater, says, yeah, soil crust. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm glad other people are excited for it, too. <laughs> I feel like How that long? would be, like, a strange, like, tribute. It's like, let's go out to the desert and really appreciate these soil crusts. Now stand here <laughs> and don't move. <laughs> just lean over a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> how often when you're writing your stories riley do you have like this thing where you're just like that is so cool or you're just smiling while you're doing your research and writing it out is that like every time it's not every time i mean this is part of being a professional journalist is sometimes um you know i love it if every story that i came out with like i was super proud of and it was saying i most want to write about that happens sometimes and i'm i'm really glad to have that but sometimes it's like you know this the story for lack of a better term I, I don't particularly like it maybe i'll try and find something different for it uh like the story is important like the story should be told maybe i'm not the most personally invested in it but like i think that it's an important thing that we've learned or for people to know and part of this is like, I'm, I'm a freelancer. Like I basically live or die by what I'm able to pitch and write about. And there are some weeks where it's like, all right, uh, rent's coming up due. I need to pitch something. What do we got? And kind of go trawling through. And that's not to say that I try and promote things that like aren't valuable to the top, but sometimes like writing's a job. It's like any other job. And what makes you a professional is showing up and doing it even when you're not excited, even when you don't want to. I'm lucky enough that I'd say maybe like 75, 80% of the time, it's stuff that I'm excited about. And I feel like I learned something new and that I can plug into something else. But there's also a number of stories where it's like, this is neat, but I'm, I am tired. <laughs> and I just need to get the story done. <laughs> and I think in some ways, like, you know, not that I expect anybody to read my work like this close, but I think sometimes you can tell. I think sometimes you can tell when I'm feeling really inspired. I feel like there's more wordplay and uh, alliteration and bad puns when I'm really excited <laughs> about something. So if you see my writing do that, be. then you'll know that I'm really jazzed about it. <laughs> um, here's a question from Paleo101. What draws you into wanting to choose certain articles to journal about? There's so much in paleo that uh, it must be hard to even pick and choose what to write about. So, like, what goes into being like, oh, I'm going to talk about this paper, but not this paper? Yeah, I think there are different reasons why. So, like, the Dire Wolf study was a good example of, like, that was something that I knew I had to write. That was, like, I am excited about this. This is super interesting. It changes a lot of what we expected. I really want to write about this. There was a, a study that I wrote for, uh, write about for, for New Scientist as well that was about the genome of a saber-toothed cat called Homotherium that had some really neat implications for their cardiovascular system and their social behavior and that sort of thing. And that was another, like, I, I just have to write about it. So that led me to kind of push it through because the Dire Wolf study in particular, like, that almost didn't happen. Like, I got the one rejection because somebody else was covering it. And then I got sort of a maybe, and I had to, like, really convince my editor, like, no, this is, you know, not just a little, like, shift for paleo. This is big implications for a lot of what we thought we knew. So that I felt really driven for. In terms of choosing other studies, honestly, it's a push and pull. There are the stories that I feel interested in and that I feel are significant. But any story that I write, I basically am going to an editor and saying, please give me money to write about this, to talk about fossils for a few minutes. So it needs to fit that publication's brand, their image, um, sort of what they typically like to publish about. There are some publications that you know, they, the editor there, the people that I work with, understand that there are differences between dinosaurs and ammonites and saber-toothed cats and fossil insects and things like that. But there are other publications I've gone to. It's like, well, we did a story, uh, a fossil story six months ago, and we're just not going to do more fossil stories this year when that one fossil story was about like sauropods and I'm writing about the Cambrian explosion. So <laughs> it's kind of, it's really getting to know your editor and the publication and what you get a feel for what they're going to say yes to. It's kind of like as you get to know your friends, you kind of know like their likes and their dislikes and what their interests are. So if you had a friend who was like 
super duper into um you know super mario brothers and that was their favorite game all, of all time you wouldn't like buy them a copy of the new doom game and say like i hope you really <laughs> like it it made me think of you um so i mean there's a lot of platforming in both fair maybe my, not my best example but still like <laughs> It's, it's that kind of vibe where yeah. what gets presented to the public, what I get to write about, is at the intersection of what I find interesting and what the publication actually is willing to put out and, and pay for. And there are plenty of studies that I've pitched that I felt passionate about. That I was like, this is really neat. We need to know, people need to know about this. And it just, it doesn't work for whatever reason. So there's always that interplay between the two. They even though like editors' names and like this whole sort of, flow of information decision making like it's not visible to the public at all it does really influence what stories get put out to the public yeah all righty here's a really tough hard-hitting question for you this is from bailey jorgensen from the elf museum uh what's your personal favorite fossil animal Ooh, oh goodness that was good. <laughs> hard questions we like, we, like, we like to bring the hard questions here at fossil yeah well, I feel like this is revenge because one of my favorite questions to ask after everything, like at, whether it's a dinner or a movie or basically anything that I ask my girlfriend all the time is, what's your favorite? Or what was your favorite? <laughs> so I, I feel like this this is getting back at me now. It, it's a hard question, right? Because I feel like I should be in like narrator voice for this. It's like, you know, 99% of all, all life that's ever existed has gone extinct. So given that, given that most life is fossil life, it's like, well, how do I even choose um you know i'm not entirely sure it's difficult to pick one i think i'm gonna go with one of these things where it's like this is what it is today ask me you know an hour from now or tomorrow and it might be different <laughs> anytime that i see a study about saber-tooth cats and you know smilodon's the most famous one so i'll say you know sort of uh metrodont cats in general, Smilodon in particular. I just get really excited for it. Like, I really want to write about it. Like, it's just, I love getting a little bit more insight because I feel like they're animals that are not only, you know, at the intersection of a bunch of my age, like I love cats and I love fossils and it's great to have those two together, but an animal that's so iconic and so interesting that we still know relatively little about, like what their biology was actually like. And there's you know, more that's unknown than, than known about them. There was just a study, um, I believe Ashley Reynolds was the author um, of it, it came out at the uh, Royal Ontario Museum, about Smilodon siblings, these two young saber cats, and like what we can learn about, well, what does that mean for parental care and the time that they spent together and all stuff. So something that like somebody might look at that and say, well, that's just like two partial skeletons, whatever. But like pulling those stories out of those bones, I really love learning about that stuff. So at least for today, I'm going to say <laughs> smile about the talents, but you know, ask me later and I might give you something else. <laughs> that works. Good that answer. Works. Yeah. Especially, you know, Brittany and I are SoCal people. So smile it on's pretty, pretty important to both of our, yeah. you know, it's upbringings as kid here. paleo people. Yeah. It's all over here. Oh, all right. All right. So I think this is going to be our uh, last question for today. Um, it's also another good question, and um, if I mispronounce this, I am so sorry. Uh, Lagerstatten? I'm not sure. Lagerstatten. 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 There we go. Thanks, guys. Okay, so um, what's a location you haven't done field work in that you would love to? Mm. Dream field work location. Jeez. I need to think for a moment because in a way I feel like when I'm doing more field work, it's sort of on the tip of my brain because everybody is talking about like where they've been or where they're going to go next. And since there wasn't really very much field work at all um, in this past year, it's it's sort of like, where are you, where do I even go for all these things? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> honestly, this is probably going to sound in a way like, I don't want to say like a letdown, but it's like, Personally, I've done field work in, um, you know, the Permian and the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, in the Paleocene and Eocene, and in the Pleistocene. But that middle part of the Cenozoic, I've done like almost nothing with, mm -hmm. at all. Um, so really, anywhere that's like Oligocene, Miocene, Pliocene, like basically like the middle of the country, some of these places like um, Ashfall Fossil Beds or mm -hmm. um, Agate Springs. Um, some of these spots, they're just so iconic and famous 
for fossil mammals. And you get a lot of these weird, you know, sort of like the mammals before our modern mammals, when you get like bear dogs and uh, North American rhinos and things like that. Locations like that, like I really love to work in just to see what they're like, how different they are, and even just personally tick them off, off the list. So I think that's what I'm going to be looking out for, like as soon as it's possible to do is, even if I don't get to do the field work there, putting together a big Cenozoic, uh, basically road trip from John oh, Day Fossil fun. Vets in Oregon through um, you know, much of Nebraska and you know, track some of these time periods. And hopefully I'll write an article about it and I'll get to share that with all of you. But even if not, I just, I just want to do it. I want to see some of these places. That's just a fun, well, that's just a fun vacation. Well, Brittany and I could recommend some places, you know, we know a few really cool mammal localities in our area. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. And you're probably much closer than some of the spots that are further to the east from me. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) (laughs) I think when, you know, it's like dinosaurs are awesome. All, but like you said, right, 90% of life has been extinct. So every single fossil locality is cool because every fossil is worth a thousand stories. So you know, go see the mammals, go to the inver- invert sites for everyone out there. Like, there's so many cool things. Everything is awesome when it comes to paleontology. I know I'm a bit of a dork when I come when I say that stuff, but you know, I get excited about all of it. We're all dorks here. We're all dorks. I would, yeah, yeah that's true. I would, I would, I would break out into a particular song about how everything is awesome. Would it not get us topics <laughs> right? So, just well, imagine no, singing that. We can't get the point right. on our channel. I know. That's why. Just imagine that I'm singing it. <laughs> A lot of what I write, like dinosaurs pay the bills. Like that's what, like dinosaurs are so popular. I, I wrote a, a chapter about dinomania for the next uh, iteration of the complete dinosaur, where I go into this a little bit. But like at this point, they're kind of it's expected that they're popular. They're popular because they're popular and everybody knows them. But I really, anytime I get the chance to write about Cenozoic mammals, like that's what really makes me happy because they're so strange. I feel like my hypothesis is to a lot of people when they look at something like let's say like synthetoceras so this thing that's uh, technically belongs to this group of hoof mammals go protoceratids imagine like a deer with like fangs mm-hmm. and then like a slingshot on its nose and then like devil horns coming off the back of its Love it. skull you're right and i think to a lot of people it's like well that's kind of like a weird deer or something but to me it's like what like what is this thing doing why is it so strange so it's, it's like a double-edged sword that you get with mammals where i feel like a lot of things people are like well that's like a kind of cat and that's like a kind of elephant and they seem like very familiar to us but because of that i think they get so overlooked that there's so many stories like a cup through the past few years research on those shovel tusked elephants things like amabelodon and platybelodon stuff that they got these big like underslung jaws with these big like chiclet like teeth that are all beveled and it's all like well they're not digging into the ground they're like picking off branches and like basically raking it against their teeth to get that vegetation like cut up so then they can eat it and it's like who would ever think that an animal would do that so i think in this in this past 66 million years there's so many stories that are as yet untold and I would love to do more stories about them, but it's it's kind of trying to overcome this popularity contest where dinosaurs really dominate so much of our attention and they are cool and they are really neat, but in some ways there has to be room for more stories. And I'm hoping that as I get further along in my career, I'll be able to balance the mammals out a little bit more. We'll see how, how well I do with that. <laughs> oh, really quick for Cam, shout out to the Paleozoic with those really weird animals and the Cambrian mm-hmm. explosion. They need more Absolutely. love too. So yeah. yes. I didn't forget it, Cam. I'm sorry. I didn't say the, the Paleozoic. There are, and, and, I, and I love Opabinia and Anomalocaris and all those Cambrian weirdos. And oh, like yeah. so many of the other time periods, like in the Devonian, like who gets excited about the Devonian and Ordovician stuff? Like we need more of that too. So hopefully, you know, we, we can get, uh, you know, I want to be redundant. I want there to be other science writers and science communicators and that maybe uh, together we can handle the past 550 million years. <laughs> I know it's a tall order, but I think we can do it. All right, that's a call out to all the future uh, science journalists out there. Help us out, okay? <laughs> all right, well, I think that does it for our episode. Riley, if anyone wants to, you know, see more of your work, follow you online, where can they go to find all that? So the primary place to find uh, what I do is through uh, my Twitter feed. So if you follow me at uh, Laylaps, it's L-A-E-L-A-P-S. Uh, that'll be the main place. I have feeds to everywhere else. I have a, re- a website that's RileyBlack.net if you want to have a look at my books and some clips and things like that. But Twitter is the main area that will lead to, uh, for example, my Telegram channel where I like every time I come out with a new article, I post it there. And it's just 
that. So if you just want to see what I'm writing, that's another great place to, to look. And I'll post that link there as well. But I'd say Twitter is the main place to start. Fantastic. Well, be sure to put all that in the description below. And so thank you so much for being our guest yeah, today. We really you. appreciate it. It's been so much fun. I was so honored when you asked me to come on here. The honor was ours. Like, you know, we've said it many times, but you were a big inspiration for us when we were starting in science communication and science education. So this is this is like one of those cool, like full circle, not full circle moments. I don't know yeah. what I'm trying to say, but we thank get, you. Get so thank you is what I'm trying to say. Each other in this yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> um, and thank you so much to all of our audience for tuning in on our first uh, episode of season three of Fossil Friday Chats. Hopefully there'll be more. Um, if you like this program and want to support programs like it at both the ALF Museum and the Western Science Center, you can find links on how to do that below. And as always, please make sure you like and subscribe to our channel. And we're also on Twitch now for more stories from the world of paleontology. And we'll see you next week. Bye, everybody.